AMD's RX 6950 XT is almost a totally different class of GPU compared to when it first launched to tepid reviews earlier this year. And with recent price adjustments, it is such a good deal now that its green opponent no longer makes any sense, and neither does its predecessor, the 6900 XT. But why am I talking about the 6000 series? Because, however the RX 7900 series performs today, and it's good, I want you to also keep in mind AMD's track record for dramatically improving the performance of their GPUs through new features and driver optimizations. Personally, I'm counting on it, because now that I have publicly committed to skipping Nvidia's latest 40 series cards, AMD is my only hope for an upgrade this generation. Just like my only hope of paying our production team is our sponsor, PDQ. Automate patch management and software updates with PDQ. Search their library of over 200 ready to deploy applications and install software zero touch from your desk. Start your free trial at pdq.com slash LTT. Right out of the gate, the 7900 series is full of upgrades. It features AMD's brand new RDNA 3 architecture, up to 24 gigabytes of much higher bandwidth GDDR6 memory, substantially boosted core clocks across the board, and this is great. The step down 7900 XT comes with as many compute units as AMD's previous flagship, with the beefier XTX rocking even more. Despite having more and faster cores though, one of AMD's boldest claims is that they've managed to improve efficiency by 54%. This is thanks in large part to AMD's high bandwidth chiplet design, the first of its kind in a modern GPU. What's more, they've beefed up their ray accelerator cores for real-time ray traced lighting in supported games, and finally included AI accelerator cores to bring Radeon to feature parity with Nvidia and Intel's offerings. Unlike those offerings, however, the Radeon RX 7900 series cards we're looking at today come equipped with DisplayPort 2.1, which enables support for up to 8K 165Hz displays. Is that even necessary? <laughs> Who cares? It's awesome! And it's something that Nvidia's top-end GPU, the RTX 4090, cannot do in spite of its staggering $1,600 sticker price. All of this is while actually fitting in your case and costing $900 and $1,000 for the XT and the XTX respectively. That is $200 to $300 less than the RTX 4080 that AMD says they should be able to compete with for speed. Of course, we won't be taking their word for that. AMD has been known to be <clears throat> optimistic. At 4K, it's clear out of the gate in Shadow of the Tomb Raider that whatever Team Red fans might have hoped for, the RX 7900 XTX is not AMD's answer to the RTX 4090. It's got performance that is realistically more in line with the 4080, though that is what AMD said. And this pattern continues in Hitman, Cyberpunk 2077, and Modern Warfare 2. Well, great, right? I mean, why did I spend all that time talking about the importance of AMD's ongoing driver developments? Keep that in mind. Well, there's this for one thing. Forza Horizon 5 is a clear loss for Team Red, thanks to those subpar 1% and 5% low frame rates. But also this for another reason. That right there is a $1,000 GPU beating a $1,600 GPU in F1 2022. And if the results I'm looking at right now are any indication of the kind of raw power that AMD's driver team has on tap here, there is some serious aging like fine wine potential on the table. Of course, you should never buy a promise though. And today, AMD's best trails Nvidia's best by about 17%, which sounds bad until you realize that Nvidia's card costs 60% more. Compared to the 4080, the XTX is a no-brainer at 9% faster and 20% cheaper, and the 7900 XT does even better. I mean, sure, the 4080 is 7% faster, but costs 33% more. 1440p doesn't always show us a difference compared to 4K, but here we do see some strange behavior in Forza that we retested several times. The 7000 series is actually slower than AMD's older 6000 series cards. 
We think this could be a problem with the game, as it's the only one out of our suite that does it. And when we went to test Forza's ray tracing performance, we saw that it was, <coughs> in fact, pretty broken. We also see the RTX 4080 pull ahead of even the XTX in Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Red Dead Redemption, which is especially surprising considering that virtually every other game shows AMD closing the gap instead. The biggest example is in Modern Warfare 2, where the minimum frame rates aren't quite up to the level of the RTX 4090, but the average frame rates are, which again hints at some potential for optimization. In total, these numbers put the 7900 series in a very good position to compete with Nvidia's 40 series to the point where, if traditional rasterized gaming was all that existed, Nvidia would need to lower their prices. But it isn't all that exists, and ray tracing is, sadly, still not AMD's strong suit. While substantially better in Cyberpunk than the RX 6000 series, these 7000 series GPUs are behind Nvidia by at least a factor of two at 4K. At 1440p, AMD at least manages to break the 30 FPS minimum mark, making the game playable, and you can use FSR to render at a lower resolution and upscale for smooth gameplay, but at that point, we could also do the same thing for Team Green, and the overall story would still be the same. F1 2022 fares slightly better for AMD at least, with the 7900 XTX pulling up to within 16% of the RTX 4080 in minimum frame rates, and actually near parity on average, which again, gives me hope that some of AMD's woes with ray tracing are a matter of optimization, and that feeling only grows with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, where even at 4K, it's within about 12% of the 4090 and churning out nearly 60 FPS. It is an older game, but that's not bad. It's just that, a uh, good race ran when the other guy ran faster is still an L. And ultimately, the RX 7900 XTX just couldn't even come close to the RTX 4080's level of performance with ray tracing enabled. I suspect that most people, myself included, still don't use ray tracing often and won't really be affected, but given that these things do still cost a thousand flipping dollars, it's definitely a skid mark on what has otherwise been a pretty good showing so far. And I'm afraid there's more where that came from. The professionals who have need of this kind of graphical horsepower will be, well, disappointed isn't quite the right word, but looking at these numbers, they're not gonna be excited either. Yes, Blender runs a good eight to 20% faster on the 7000 versus the 6000 series, but Nvidia walks all over AMD's entire stack at between three to four times the performance. Thankfully, AMD's new encoding engine helps them push ahead of the RTX 4080 in DaVinci Resolve in both H.264 and especially H.265, which their encoding engine seems to favor. That's a good 20% more speed for the XTX there, not bad though the 4090 does remain on top. Procyon Video and Photo are also pretty good for AMD with performance that I would call comparable. It's within a few percentage points either way you look at it, and rounding out the video editing suite is Topaz AI, which, despite the name, is using GPU compute here rather than any AI cores. And wow, even the 7900 XT outperforms the RTX 4090 here. This workload seems to heavily favor AMD's Infinity Cache, as the 6000 series cards aren't too shabby either. SpecViewPerf brings AMD about as many wins as losses, but the degree to which the 7000 series wins over the competition is often much lower than the losses that they suffer, with especially poor results in 3DS Max, Maya, and SolidWorks, which even dip under the performance of the 6000 series. That's pretty rough. Those are kind of, kind of important applications. They pull off major wins in Katia, Creo, Energy, Medical, and especially Siemens NX, though, as we've said in the past, this is because the version in SpecViewPerf doesn't support hardware acceleration on NVIDIA, and actually, this is just gonna be excluded from our averages when we calculate it later on. Spec Workstation paints the Radeons in a significantly better light though, with product development, life sciences, and energy all pushing well past Team Green, but media and entertainment, as well as GPU compute, still stay with Nvidia, likely thanks to OpenCL's relative obscurity next to CUDA. Despite the blows the 7900 series cards took though, their beefed up media engines and GPU compute horsepower placed them within an average of two to 10% of Team Green. Given the wide performance spread we saw, depending on the workload, potential prospective professional people will wanna think long and hard about which capabilities are most important to them before making a final decision. 
Changing gears a little, we found something interesting when we were testing resizable bar on both Intel and AMD platforms. It seems like the performance improvements, regardless of whether you have a Team Blue or Team Red CPU, can be expected to be pretty similar, despite AMD heavily marketing smart access memory as a selling point for the Ryzen Plus Radeon ecosystem. Bear in mind that this is a sample size of just two games, but without resizable bar, we're figuring you can expect anywhere from a 10 to 35% reduction in performance, regardless of which side you swing for. As for AMD's updated video encoder, there's a lot to be excited about here. AV1 support and baked in machine learning to improve quality at the top of my list. But despite receiving our cards early, we actually only had a few days to test these things prior to embargo because we didn't have a driver. So we were forced to push our image quality comparisons to a separate video that you can expect to see in the next couple of weeks. One of AMD's other selling points is its smaller footprint compared to Nvidia's 40 series GPUs. And I was concerned that this would come at the expense of thermals. So I was extremely pleased to see that AMD's new cooler design has the 7000 series actually performing better than the 6000 series. With that said though, AMD does not have the luxury of only competing with themselves and Nvidia is clearly in the better position here. Though with that said, both of the NVIDIA cards we tested have substantially larger heat sinks with fan off modes, while AMD's new cards always ran their fans. It's probable that designs from the likes of ASUS or PowerColor will run much cooler and hopefully quieter. Now, we need to talk about core clocks because they're a little different this generation thanks to the decoupling of the front end and the shader clocks. The idea here is that the front end will benefit more from higher clocks, while the more numerous shader units crunch data in parallel at a lower clock speed, resulting in a better balance of performance and efficiency. And you can see that in action here, where both the 7900 XTX and XT have a consistent 200 megahertz gap between the two clocks. And even in a power virus like MSI Combustor, these clocks remained higher than the previous generation. Clock stability in game is similar to the 6000 series cards, but Nvidia's 40 series manages flatter lines throughout the run, suggesting that AMD is trying to be pretty aggressive with managing power consumption. Which makes sense because AMD talked a lot about performance per watt in their marketing. And looking at these in-game power graphs, well, that seems to suggest that their self-congratulations are well justified. The Radeon RX 7900 XTX drew comparable power to the 4080, and this held even when we hit it with MSI Combustor. The XT was even better still, staying in line with its predecessor. But what's interesting is when we take a magnifying glass to how many watts the 7000 series pulls per frame. In this example, while the raw wattage drops much closer to the RTX 4080, when we cap the frame rate to 100, the total watts per frame increases substantially. This suggests that while the RTX 4080 is able to throttle itself effectively, AMD is actually having some trouble with power management. And AMD's idle power consumption numbers seem to corroborate this. Where the RTX 4080 idles at around 15 to 20 watts, the 7900 XTX regularly sucks back 40 and sometimes over 50 watts while doing nothing at all. What's even more baffling is that we noticed what seems like a major bug during our testing. Depending on the monitor that we plugged into the GPU, we saw wildly different total system power at the wall, from a respectable 52 watts with nothing plugged in to a whopping 171 watts with our 27 inch ROG Swift bench display. Using some other monitors even caused performance to drop. Now, given that I have a high-end display and I live in Vancouver, Canada, where energy is the one thing that is still cheap, None of this is a deal breaker for me, but if I was in Europe where energy prices have surged, pun intended, it would give me pause before I was willing to look at Team Red. Adding insult to injury, this high idle power draw means that the fans are spinning at all times, kicking that heat out into your room, even if you're just scrolling Reddit, meaning that the 7900 series is gonna be a little less comfortable to live with. Maybe if you go Team Red, you could pick up a blank T rather than a retro polar fleece from LTDstore.com. Space heater. <laughs> One possible explanation for this high idle power consumption could be that this is a similar situation to the Ryzen 7 5800X3D. That CPU's use of 3D vCache limited its stability if voltages weren't dialed in just right. And we could be witnessing similar teething issues with this new chiplet architecture. 
And supporting that theory is the fact that the driver straight up locks out power adjustments below 90% of total board power. When we asked them about this, AMD played pretty coy with us, which tells us either we're right or that they're not sure either. Now it's time to talk about what this data means for the GPU market. First of all, anyone who was hoping that the 7900 series would come in and compete head to head against the RTX 4090 will be sorely disappointed, at least for today. We saw brief glimpses of glory, but the RTX 4090 remains on its throne, making it tough to dislodge its price from that TI Titan perch that it currently occupies as a Halo product. But while AMD doesn't have a direct competitor to it, I still think the 7900 XTX is a much better value. As for the RTX 4080, well, the comparison gets a little more complicated. Even the XT model comes really close in traditional rendering, and the value proposition of either 7900 GPU is a damning indictment of Nvidia's pricing. But AMD does remain on the back foot in ray tracing performance, and that's something that Nvidia can point to and claim makes up the difference, even if nobody seriously cares. It'll take people like me running out and buying 7900 series cards instead of 40 series to make Nvidia realize that they're out to lunch. But wait, why are we saying this now, you might think? We took a lot of flack for covering for Nvidia's pricing in the RTX 4080 review, didn't we? Well, not so much. First off, we compared it to cards that were available at the time it released, and we ended the video with a message to wait for RDNA 3. And we are reviewing the 7900 series in much the same way. Second, it had already been made known that the RX 7900 XTX was not going to compete with the 4090, which, depending on how you look at it, means that either the RTX 4080 is actually a 90-class card and priced accordingly, with the 4090 being a, a, a TI or something, or the 7900 XT and XTX are the current gen equivalent of the 6800 and 6800 XT and are themselves overpriced. Basically, it's kind of a game of pick your villain at this point, because the reality is that $600 top of the line GPUs are a thing of the past, and that was an assumption that our review made, but did not fully explain. It's worth pointing out, by the way, since I'm being a downer right now anyway, that while AMD supports DisplayPort 2.1 and NVIDIA's 40 series does not, AMD went with a half measure by supporting only the UHBR 13.5 spec. What this means is that it can only achieve its lofty resolution and frame rate support through display stream compression. DSC allows up to three times more bandwidth and is both near zero latency and visually lossless, though that doesn't mean that there is no quality loss. Practically speaking, this won't be a problem even if it were noticeable, given that these GPUs aren't really capable of pushing those resolutions and frame rates anyway, but we brought it up with the RTX 40 series, so we're bringing it up here for the sake of completeness. It means that those new 8K ultra-wide displays being shown off at CES will just barely be able to run at 85 Hz without DSC, but I would never expect that to be a problem for an actual user. One slightly problematic thing that I do need to address is that we've taken a very glass half full approach today, and I can understand why some of you might be frustrated by it. We've gone and spun AMD's potential future driver improvements as a good thing, when actually they're kind of bad. Another perspective is that it means that AMD is releasing these products even though they haven't really finished optimizing them. And if you've kind of felt that way up to this point, I totally get where you're coming from. We ran into some kind of bizarre, no, really bizarre crashes, and there are certainly features that could be added or refined. But in fairness to our charitable approach today, AMD is pricing these GPUs according to what they are now, and their track record for fixing these things is actually pretty good, even if sometimes it takes a while as they focus on new features like FSR 3.0 and the Hyper RX performance optimizer that have yet to launch. And if this is where performance is now, with somewhat broken, certainly unoptimized drivers, AMD clearly has some great hardware on their hands here. They even brought back the USB-C port, something that is great for hooking up a monitor via a single cable and a godsend for enthusiasts like myself. I'm still mad that Nvidia removed it after the 20 series. So the RX 7900 XTX is going into my gaming rig and I'm officially switching to Team Red for the first time since the 3870. Goodness gracious. The performance is good enough. The price is good enough. 
well, at least compared to the competition. And the downsides are small enough that I am comfortable making the leap. Just like I'm gonna comfortably leap to this segue from our sponsor. MSI and their recently released MAG Z790 Tomahawk Wi-Fi motherboard. The MAG 790 Tomahawk is a gaming-oriented ATX motherboard that balances value with premium hardware. It's built around the latest Intel Z790 chipset, which supports 12th and 13th gen Intel Core processors. With dual 8-pin power connectors and Core Boost technology, it's able to sustain heavy CPU power loads to better support demanding game settings. It also features M.2 Shield Frozer, MSI's advanced thermal solution, which offers great protection for maximum SSD transfer speed performance. With integrated options for multiple cooling methods, the Z790 Tomahawk ensures optimal performance when you need it the most. Make sure to check it out at the link in the video description. If you enjoyed this and you're looking for something else to watch, maybe go check out that ARC 30 day challenge video I mentioned. Intel's doing some really good things over there, but they also have a lot of work to do.